whatever it is. Members, we have got quorum now for the purposes of taking evidence. So I want to declare the meeting open to the public and can I remind you all that this committee meeting, fully virtual as is now the custom, um, is recorded and will be broadcast online. So today at present, we have the following members attend via video conference and myself, Emma Sheen, the chair. We've got Mike Nett, our vice chair. We've got Michelle McElveen, Carl Nicole, and Paula Bradshaw. We don't have any um, recorded apologies at this stage, so we can expect that perhaps Christopher Stalford and, and Mark Durkin will join us at uh, some point throughout the meeting. So the first item on the agenda was apologies, and we, we don't have any apologies recorded unless members are aware of any. Nope. Okay, so with that, we can move on to the second item on our trial this afternoon, and we've got a briefing um, from the Human Rights Commission, uh, advice on the Bill of Rights to the Secretary of State uh, for the North in 2008. And we've got a, a briefing this afternoon from Dr. David Russell and from Rhiannon Blythe. So I would like to welcome Rhiannon and David to the meeting and allow them to begin their presentation. Thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, well, look, thanks very much for the opportunity to attend today and give evidence to the committee. And can I just start by passing on the Commission's condolences to Michelle and, and colleagues on the committee. Um, I just heard before we come on about um, the passing of Jimmy Spratt and the Commission is very saddened to learn, to learn that. Um, to turn then to your evidence, uh, as members are fully aware, the Human Rights Commission published its advice to the Secretary of State on a proposed Bill of Rights in 2008. And the Commission stands over the recommendations contained in the advice, and we believe that this should be the starting point for the Committee's deliberations, since it continues to represent a thorough consideration of the mandate set down in the 1998 Belfast Agreement. I think it's important to put on record the 2008 advice is neither maximalist, as sometimes been accused, nor does it unduly minimise what might legitimately be described as the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. And answering such a question is and will remain subjective. What constitutes the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland is an ongoing dispute of competing historic narratives, as committee members will be fully aware. And we think it would be unreasonable to expect the committee to resolve this conflict. And we therefore advise that any temptation, if you have one to do so, would best be avoided. A more productive approach would be for members to reflect upon the 1998 mandate generously, while focusing on the pressing question of what provisions are required in a Bill of Rights that would be fit for purpose in 2021 and beyond. The committee should afford as much attention to the question of what are the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland as it does to what were the particular circumstances, whether that be in 1998, 1969, or 100 years ago in 1921. The agreements mandate was not reduced to answering the latter question of what were the particular circumstances, and this is a point that appears to have been lost at times in the public and political discourse. Members should be mindful in their deliberations of the future and ensure that any recommendations supplementing the European Convention on Human Rights would stand the best of time. It's worth bearing in mind that Convention rights themselves have always been interpreted organically by the European Court of Human Rights rather than treated as static since their inception in the 1950s. Turning then to the substantive content of a Bill of Rights, we would recommend that the committee begins by recognising that any proposals it makes must be underpinned by a principle of first to do no harm. The Commission, I can remember, was very careful to ensure that it did nothing to undermine the existing legal system or institutions of government when they provided its advice. And in addition, there's a second principle of non retrogression and that was an important measure also that guided the Commission's approach. The committee should commit to this principle and guard against any attempt to utilise the process for anything other than raising the bar beyond the current levels of protection that we all enjoy. Important to note 
that the exercise completed by the Commission wasn't one of supporting an increase in judicial responsibilities at the expense of the legislature or executive, as it has sometimes been caricatured. A significant amount of effort was made to ensure that the existing balance between the three branches of government um, and the established separation of powers would be maintained. The Commission also didn't propose the creation of new human rights, but rather the further entrenchment of protections that largely exist in domestic law and reflect international obligations freely entered into by the United Kingdom or relevant developments in jurisprudence. Human rights, again, as the committee will be aware, exist within a wider democratic framework, and they must therefore be interpreted in light of those conditions. They're designed to safeguard the individual in a real and practical way, and they're constantly evolving. Members should acknowledge this fact in our view and reflect on the need for a Bill of Rights to be designed as a living instrument and one that must be able to withstand changes elsewhere in law over time. With this point in mind, I would advise against adopting a disproportionate amount of time on the question of what substantive rights merit inclusion and which don't. The framework for determining which protections are already recognised in the UK and it's well established and those which supplement the European Convention on Human Rights can be listed simply by drawing upon the provisions of other ratified regional and international instruments to which the UK is a party and that binds the Northern Ireland Assembly. And this holds true, by the way, regardless of the category of rights in question. So civil and political rights, economic, social or cultural rights, they're all exactly the same. And members may have heard it suggested and other evidence to date um, that you've maybe taken of one or more of these categories of rights, particularly social and economic rights, that if they were to be protected in a bill, that this would set a dangerous precedent or that it would be doing something that's unheard of elsewhere. It's important to put on record that this, is, this view is simply wrong and perhaps it's driven more by ideological views than legal facts. The committee doesn't have to look very far to see why I'm saying this. In fact, you don't have to look beyond the Convention itself to see examples of every type of right already entrenched in UK domestic law. If you think of social rights, you only have to think about the right to education. If you think about economic rights, you only have to look to the right to, uh, right to property. In fact, any plethora of social and economic rights, you will see examples of it in the jurisprudence of Article 8, the right to family and private life. A majority of the Convention is concerned with shielding individuals from undue interference by the state with limited qualifications. And this is largely framed in what's often referred to as negative liberty, underpinned by a requirement of non-interference that seeks to guarantee individuals are safeguarded against arbitrary government interference. However, in order to protect and promote rights and freedoms, the Convention also operates in practice to guarantee the enforcement of rights this has been interpreted by the courts to mean that the state is not only re required to refrain from actions that would amount to an undue or unjustifiable interference in an individual's exercising of their rights, but also to recognise that there are positive obligations upon the government to take action in order to protect rights in ways that enable claimants to realise them in practice. So a majority of the, com of the Commission's 2008 advice supplemented the Convention by recommending a set of positive obligations be it further entrenched in law, many of which, as I've said, have already been established in domestic legislation or through jurisprudence. And what we have tried to do for the committee, and members will have the papers um, in front of them already, is we have tried to set out in our submission um, detail to assist the committee on how such provisions could be constructed. The final point then, Chair, that I'd like to make just by way of opening, is that the Commission, the Commission notes that the political landscape has changed considerably since 2008, and withdrawal from the European Union has removed some of the protections afforded by EU law in particular. Um, it's notable that this includes the Court of Justice and the clear and straightforward application of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. In the absence of a Bill of Rights since the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, the Charter has probably served as an instrument most closely aligned to the vision set out in 1998 of enforceable rights that supplement the provisions of the Convention. So in the present vacuum, it's our observation that the reverse would hold true if a Bill of Rights is enacted. 
Put simply, a Bill of Rights has the possibility of filling the gap that exists now in our human rights architecture uh, for both now and the future. Um, that's all I have by way of opening remarks, Chair. Um, I'd be very happy, Rhiannon and myself, to take any questions that members might have. Thank you very much, David. Rhiannon, you're not coming in no. Brilliant. I, I wasn't sure before I would start with the question. David, the first thing I want to ask you about um, relates closely to your closing remarks there in relation to the gap that we have now as a result of, of uh, Brexit and the loss of the, the implementation of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And I know that in the submission to the consultation, you had referred to the fact that at a previous time, the British government hadn't ruled out repealing the, the Human Rights Act. They obviously at the at the minute have just um, closed the, the consultation period or the, the submission period for the review of the Human Rights Act, um, which I would like to, to ask you about in terms of whether or not you as a commission have responded to that and what your views are around, you know, their their latest promise that they wouldn't repeal the HRA or that they they um, remained committed to the ECHR. But we have seen in the past 24 hours that the, the British government have taken a unilateral decision around the the e extension um, in, in terms of the movement of goods. We had seen before Christmas the internal market bill. So people here could be forgiven for not having the greatest faith in the British government and what they say they're going to do in terms of rights. Um, so I wondered if I could drill down there on, on, the, on the issue of the gap and where a bill of rights fits in there. Yeah, so um, well, let, let me start with the current review. review. Um, so the, the commission is, is submitting to the review, has done, and the chief commissioner, along with the, commis the chief commissioners of the other national human rights institutions in the UK, will be given evidence later this month to the Joint Committee on Human Rights in Westminster. It is an inquiry ongoing at the minute on the review. Um, our position on it is, is pretty simple at one level. So... Um, as members will know, bringing the European Convention on Human Rights into domestic law in the UK was a commitment of the Good Friday Agreement. Um, so that's the starting point. Uh, the ECHR was given domestic force through the Human Rights Act, and that should remain in place. And from the Commission's point of view, that means the enforcement mechanism and the mechanics behind the, the Human Rights Act and really, the, the terms of reference for the current review are focused on that, not the substantive protections, as far as I understand it, but the mechanics. Um, for example, the scope for judicial interpretation, taking into account the jurisprudence of the European Court. And anything that diminishes that, um, as a commission, we, we are opposed to. Um, and, and we stand alongside the other UK commissions in that regard. There was a previous review, as you know, uh, a Bill of Rights committee established by, by the UK government to look at the possibility of a UK Bill of Rights. And the Commission's view with regards to the Human Rights Act and the e ECHR was really set down then, and we haven't changed our view since. I don't know, Rianne, if you've anything to add. Uh, just just one point, um, Chair, and, and really we can, of course, provide our submission um, once it becomes um, publicly available. But we have recommended that the independent review team engage with the committee, um, given the, I suppose, the, the importance of the Northern Ireland context and the fact that the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland are, are very much different from the rest of the UK. Um, so we have recommended that there is that engagement with the committee. Thank you. Following on from that, obviously, Article Two, the protocol, and the focus on the focus on the, the institutions here in terms of yourselves, the Equality Commission, the Human Rights Commission, and the twenty six counties, and the role that you would have in uh, protecting and the non diminution of rights principle. I'm conscious that we're in an extraordinary, extraordinary time, and that COVID has taken precedence over a lot of things, and people aren't perhaps traveling as much as they would have been people that would regularly cross the border or might be availing of some of the European rights that they, they've grown accustomed to aren't doing so in in the current um, time because of, of the pandemic. But I wondered if you have been made aware of, of any breaches and what the sort of information sharing around that 
is, is looking like from, from your perspective? <clears throat> it's fair to say we haven't been inundated by members of the public, um, probably for the reasons that you have, have set out. Um, but we have had some queries. Um, and some of the problems that we're seeing at the minute, um, one of them, I, I note the minister, relevant minister mentioned it the other day, is things that might have been um, in advance thought of being as north-south issues. Some of them have been presenting themselves east-west. Um, so, for example, uh, individuals that need the use of a service dog and the ability to have east-west movement as a consequence of restrictions coming in through the, the implementation of the protocol have been raised with the Commission. And, and we've, we've written to the Minister in there about, about the issue jointly with the Equality Commission. Um, but to be honest, it, it's quite early days yet for the reasons that you said. Um, one of the things that was flagged up to us early on um, it was put to, to us on numerous occasions by officials is that Brexit will result in what's been referred to as an, an inevitable asymmetry of rights. Um, and what that means in practice really is um, the sorts of rights that individuals will hold um, in, in the post-Brexit context may be different for Irish citizens for, um, and for British citizens. Um, not least because, as members will know, uh, there's an agreement in the, in the treaty terms that Irish citizens will retain their EU rights. Now, how that will play itself out in practice is yet to be determined. But obviously, anything that results in an asymmetry of rights, whether that's a or not, is of concern to the Commission. Um, and so that's our principal focuses at the minute. Yeah, lastly... And again, it ties in with what you're talking about there around the asymmetry of rights. And I know you've used that terminology before and the gap as we you know, come out of the, the period of Brexit and as we have left the EU, the thought that you know Irish citizens in the North who were born at the same time as their British counterparts may end up with different uh, rights, basically accesses because of the virtue of the fact that they're European citizens whole Emma D'Souza case and the, and the fact that it highlighted that anyone born here is considered British whether or not they've ever accessed that. The, sort of tied in with that and, and following on from that, I wanted to ask you around the particular circumstances and I know both in your submission and in your oral presentation this, evening, or this afternoon you referred to the fact that um, the, the circumstances of 1998 and the circumstances of 2021 are the circumstances in the North have changed. Um, but following on from that, we see gaps you know, with women's reproductive rights, with uh, rights for the trans community here. And I, I wondered if you would elaborate on, on whether or not that those things should be considered particular circumstances here because the North is in a different place to uh, uh, other jurisdictions across these islands. Um, well, ge generally speaking, bills of rights anywhere in the world are, are written with a certain degree of looking to the future. Um, and the, the reason why that's the case is that documents, including, for instance, the Human Rights Act, which is probably as close as we've got at the moment in the UK, have what's often referred to as constitutional standing. They're higher law. Um, so it's unusual for them to be amended. So any Bill of Rights that's drafted anywhere in the world, if the drafters are, are really sort of at the game, um, they're mindful as to what the future would hold. Now, for your question, that sort of draw, draws out two possibilities. The, the risk of being specific in the provision of rights is that um, the more specific you get and the less general you come at, in the levels of protection, the less scope there is for it to be flexible over time. So generally speaking, as a consequence, when you look at bills of rights around the world, the provisions are in quite general terms, right to health, right to education, so on and so forth, usually complemented with a very strong anti-discriminatory clause that's either freestanding or attaches to all the other rights in the bill. Um, and when the Commission provided its advice, that was the approach that the Commission adopted in 2008, and that was really the rationale behind it a general set of rights. Um, if you raise, for example, the issue of reproductive health care, as a, the example you just you just gave, um, 
what the right to health meant in 2008 in terms of that issue is different from what the right to health means in 2021. So if the, if the Commission's provision had have been included as, as was back in 2008, it may not have amounted to the same reproductive health care rights as that provision would mean in practice today. So the general approach to be recommended, I think, is, is probably best. The one exception to that in, in, in the Commission's advice was the rights of children. Um, the Commission advised that a specific set of provisions be laid down in a Bill of Rights for children. And the reasoning for that is the rights of children are distinct from all other claimants in that they have a degree of what's called horizontal application. So the responsibility doesn't just sit with a state, it sits quite considerably with the parent or guardian. And that was, that was part of the driving force as to why children should be treated differently. Rihanna, and I don't know again if you have anything to add. No, David, I think you've covered it in terms of the, the fact that a Bill of Rights should stand the test of time. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you both for, for that. I'm going to pass on now to Meg and then I've got Paula and Carl have indicated as well. Okay, Chair, thank you very much. Uh, Rianne and David, thanks for engaging. Um, David, you're not the first witness to suggest that the 189 pages of your report published on International Human Rights Day in 2008 is, is the starting point. But my question is, Bearing in mind, you couldn't get all the human rights commissioners to buy into it, never mind the Northern Ireland office on behalf of the UK government. But why do you believe it's different today? Well, the first thing, the first thing I would say, Mike, about that is, as a committee, you're the first people, as far as I'm aware, to have the detailed scrutiny of the document. Um, so I think you hopefully will be in a position at the end of this to have a much more informed opinion than perhaps the document has been given up until this point. And that would be my starting point on it. Um, so, are you saying the NIO didn't go through it line by line? Well, I think what I would say, Mike, is they went through it line by line, but I find it quite astounding that having gone through it line by line, a bill of rights, the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland were reduced by the Northern Ireland office to two provisions. Um, and I've never had the conversation as to why that was the case, but I think you would have to have a very minimalist view of the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland to suggest that supplementing the convention means only two rights. So I wouldn't want to speak. I wouldn't want to speak on 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 their behalf, and, and certainly with the passage of time, maybe their attitude to it may have changed. Well, that that needs tested. I, I would agree with you there. Uh, given the passage of time, had we accepted that document and put it into statute as a bill of rights, what impacts do you think it would have had in a practical sense uh, over the last thirteen years? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, to start with the, where, where we are immediately, um, I think the conversation about um, protections and rights and freedoms in the context of Brexit might have been very different if we had have had a Bill of Rights, because people would have had something to reach for in the context of uh, the European Charter and the European Court of Justice, the fact that their jurisdiction has been lost. There would have been something more substantive to frame that around in the local context. Um, now I don't know what that would have meant in practice, but um, but certainly the framework would have been different. One of the things that have happened over time, I mean, look at some of the cases that the Commission has been involved with. A Bill of Rights might have played those out slightly differently. Um, and, and also, uh, dealing with the past, um, the Article 2 obligations, um, reconciliation, all the things that people were very mindful of in 1998, the frameworks for those, the legislation, the implementation or lack of implementation of them may well have looked very different if we had have had a Bill of Rights in place, particularly one that was justiciable. 
And all your recommendations, you want it to be judiciable. Yes, but the important thing is to, to differing extents, um, not all directly enforceable in the same way. Um, and I know you have already taken evidence on this, but social and economic rights need to be treated very differently in some regards to civil and political rights. Um, and, and really what we have done in our mission is lay out uh, how they might be constructed. And that's something we think the committee should consider very carefully because there's at least four different ways of framing positive obligations. And the majority, if not all, the recommendations that the Commission made were positive obligations. You, you said something there, David, that makes me think I may have misunderstood an important element of Brexit. It was my understanding that in GB, uh, the ultimate legal authority is the Supreme Court, but in Northern Ireland, it's still the European Court of Justice. No. No, the Court of Justice has no jurisdiction in the UK as a whole from the moment of Brexit. Okay. The only, the only difference, Mike, to be quite honest, and we'll have to see how this plays out, is under Article 2 of the Protocol, um, the UK government has committed to the non-diminution of the rights protected in the Good Friday Agreement and the relevant section. And they have also committed to dynamic alignment with six of the core equality and non-discrimination directives of the European Union going forward. Now, what that will mean in practice, if you want to know what those directives mean in practice going forward, well, ultimately the authority who determines that is the European Court of Justice. So there will have to still be some reading across at times, I would imagine, for the jurisprudence of that court. But the court itself will no longer, well, doesn't have jurisdiction in Northern Ireland or anywhere in the UK from at the moment, and none will have. Thank you for that clarification. You mentioned um, the problems in terms of east to west, as you mentioned. You didn't, you didn't say guide dogs, you said? It was guide dogs, it was referring to, yeah. Any yeah. service dog. Yeah. And you've written the deer? Yeah, we've written, we've written to Minister Lyons. Um, I think um, Minister Putz had initially suggested that the new regime that was due to come in in April, he had extended it as far as I understood until July. And we wrote welcoming that extension because we have had an individual approach to the Commission raising this as a concern. Someone had been travelling into the West and was concerned that effectively, as far as I understand it, um, service animals are treated like farm animals. They're going to require enhanced vaccination certificates. And obviously that will impact on people with disabilities, freedom of movement. And that's really the angle that we're coming at. It's not so much an Article 2 issue under the, under the treaty, but the general human rights and equality concern. Yeah, Adam, I'm very sympathetic to the, to, to the argument. But you, you know, you're writing to DERA rather than, than to DEFRA. This is, this is a matter for the protocol, which is an international treaty. No, uh, what we have done is we've written in the first instance to DERA because the, the minister had extended the grace period until July, and we were writing welcoming that, but, but highlighting that this was an issue. Um, and the minister has responded. Uh, so we were watching the space basically to see between now and, and the grace period. Will, will will that matter be resolved? And obviously the Secretary of State has just made an announcement extending it further again. So that pushes it back. But if, if we get, go beyond grace periods, are, are we actually talking about a potential situation where if we had a Bill of Rights, the protocol could be incompatible with it? No, no, the protocol would be compatible with the Bill of Rights because... So the, the objective of the the objective of the protocol in the, in the first instance from our perspective of the commission is to protect the floor of human rights protection and actually increase it going forward um, so the bill should be totally compatible with it if you mean this example in practice yeah. that, 
compatible with the Bill of Rights? Well, that, that, that would depend what the committee decides to recommend should be in the Bill of Rights. Yeah, but it, it's then, it is possible there could be an incompatibility. Well, it is. Yes, it's possible. It depends on what the content is. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. No problem, Mike. I have got Paula who's on the kit at next. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you, David, uh, for coming along today, uh, Rhiannon. It's um, my question is really about the potential for um, the incorporation of the international human rights treaties into domestic law. And I'm talking about CEDAW, uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, etc., that you'd outlined previously during our training session. And I'm just wondering the, the degree to which um, it, that would be an important um, step forward in terms of our pre-legislative scrutiny, uh, pre scrutiny role in the Assembly. So that's my first question. Well, um, in, incorporation of the treaties is, is a slightly different thing to the Bill of Rights. I mean, you could take a different tact where you choose to just take the text of the treaties and inc incorporate them and give them domestic effect. So um, for, for many states around the world, there, there's basically, as committee members know, there's two systems, a dualist legal system or a monist legal system. And in the monist system like France, when the state party signs the international treaty, effectively it is domestic force. So Paula, what you're suggesting is, because we're a dualist system, could we bring the treaties in? Now, that is a process that's underway in Scotland. And the SNP government has committed Initially, it had committed to full incorporation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. But laterally, it is now committed to all of the core treaties. So there's a process underway in Scotland. There has already been a process underway, somewhat completed in Wales, to, have, to bring in limited domestic force to the, um, to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, so it's not without precedent. Our point as the Commission in our evidence was, if you're looking to create rights in a Bill of Rights, as opposed to just bringing the treaties in, the best place to look, and it's what the Commission did, is simply look to the treaties. And there's a couple of reasons why. One, the rights are already formulated and have the lineage of being tested in international law for many, many years. And the courts in the UK are increasingly used to those treaties and, and and look to them in their own case law, um, and and then and then finally, if if you start off with the treaties, you can be absolutely sure that um, it, the the construction of the rights in question will will operate in practice properly. Um, so there's you know it's it's rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, the exercise in a bill of rights for the modern era, in our view, shouldn't be one of trying to construct new rights. It's it's not as if we're taking us back to the 1800s or to the US Declaration of Independence and, and the Bill of Rights in the USA. The rights already exist. So why, why make the task more difficult than it needs to be? I, I think it was actually closer to what you were suggesting as opposed to some sort of very elaborate rule for, from us. But the, the second part really is around um, if we do go for what could be called an expansive um, Bill of Rights that would incorporate socioeconomic and you know, be quite quite reflective of society and the, and the gaps that are there and that are brought to us in evidence from stakeholder groups. Um, to what degree do you think the Secretary of State and the NIO would, would look favourably upon that if there was widespread support across the Bill of Rights and the, the Chamber and how that might have looked quite different in 2008, for example, um, where they maybe had a different attitude towards the test for particular circumstances? Yeah, I mean, I, like I say, the, the discussion around the particular circumstances is completely subjective. I'm sure committee members and I'm sure members of the Human Rights Commission, if you sat everyone around the table, everyone would have a different view on what the particular circumstances are. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a red herring in my way because um, certainly in terms of when the Commission gave its advice, what else would you expect from a Human Rights Commission other than it to take an, a, a relatively liberal approach in terms of interpreting the particular circumstances? That is, after all, what we're tasked with doing maximizing rights protections for people in Northern Ireland. And, and that's the task that we did. Um, so whether, for example, you can argue that health 
is a particular circumstance because of the impacts that the conflict had on people's health and their access to health care. I mean, for some people, that's legitimate, and for others, so I think it's a futile exercise. The experience of the Commission would suggest that it's a futile exercise to try and engage in that. Um, and rather than thinking of maximalist, the point I was making in my open remarks is there's nothing in the mandate of 1998 that says um, that it, it was the particular circumstances in 1998. It simply says the particular circumstances. So surely it is far better for the committee to consider what would a Bill of Rights be that would be fit for purpose today in 2021, properly reflecting back on the, the history of and, and the, the lessons from the past, but more importantly, what would a Bill of Rights look like if it's going to be fit for purpose for the future and for future generations? Because it must stand the test of time. All good Bills of Rights around the world have stood the test of time, and they're very rarely subject to amendments. And in the US, Bill of Rights is amended. It's a big, big deal. You know, People turn to the amendments and cite them. They're significant constitutional moments. Um, and that's exactly the same for here. With regards to, the, um, with regards to the, the view of the UK government, let me say a couple of things. First of all, we're really talking about social and economic rights here. Uh, there's not much dispute over civil and political, but social and economic rights are well grounded in UK domestic law. Uh, most people can take social and economic rights claims now through Article 8 of the Convention. And as I said in my opening remarks, there's already examples in the Convention itself of social and economic rights. The right to education is guaranteed under the Convention. It's set down in the Convention and what it means in practice as is the right to property. And you don't have to look very far to see other examples of these rights in practice. So even in terms of concepts like progressive realization that the committee will be aware of, I took the liberty before coming on this morning just to check out what the UK has done in some of the UK overseas territories. And then uh, the first example I came across was in Cayman. So the Cayman Islands Constitution is a, an act of primary legislation by the Westminster Parliament. The right to education in Cayman is constructed as follows. Government shall seek reasonably to achieve the progressive realization within available resources of providing every child with primary and secondary education, which shall be subject to a section of the, the Constitution and be free. So even progressive realization is already established in primary Westminster legislation for parts of the UK sovereign territory. Um, and it's, it's not with, it wouldn't be without precedent. And interestingly, the, even, even more progressive in rights terms, uh, the protection of the environment is also set down in some of the constitutional provisions of the UK overseas territories. So there's, there's literally nothing that this committee could recommend in rights terms that won't already have established precedent not even in the rest of Europe, but actually in the UK itself, in UK law. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you. Okay, Paula. So I'm going to bring Carol in now. Can I just ask everybody that isn't speaking, just if your mics are on mute, there's a bit of interference there. So just if you're not talking, just have your mic on mute. I know that it's right beside the leave call button, so it's very easy to, to make that mistake. Carol, wheel away. Um, thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks, Rhiannon. Um, so some of the questions I was going to ask have already been raised. But the, the concern I have is, um, so even some of the ECHR stuff, for example, the social, social and economic rights are already there. It's the implementation of those rights is where the deficits are. Um, and, and that's the problem. And even some of the contributors earlier on, some of the different witnesses were almost arguing without actually saying it against social and economic rights because they said, you know, this is going to be, you know, all things to all people and it'll end up meaning nothing. And my question's always in my head, if I didn't already say it was, well, what rights are you going to give some and what rights are you going to deny the others? So it's sad. But my real concern is it's around the charter. Um, Renee's EU justice in the charter 
um, and the avoidance of any diminution of power. Um, so obviously the 2008 position without even getting into the review of the Human Rights Act, the 2008 position by the Commission um, would still stand even with Brexit, even with that unforeseen circumstance. Um, so it's a question I'm asking rather than, you know, giving a statement, that's one thing. And then the other aspect is we just come out of a health committee and, for example, you know, Wales lifted recommendations from CEDAW and put them above when it came to the rights of the child because they wanted to strengthen their own domestic law. And they used that as well as ACHR to try and strengthen the rights of the child, children for Wales. I remember your conversation about horizontal and vertical rights. I'm still trying to get my head around that. I think I understand it better now. But the point is um, that for me, the concern is the impact of Brexit and the avoidance of any diminution of power. And then basically, you know, once the Bill of Rights is established, um, what can you do to ensure that those rights are implemented? Because if they're not, it seems to go back to the court, you know. And to be frank, I know this is a political comment, so I'm not expecting you to. But when you look at the complete opposition to social housing uh, for people on the basis of, basis of sectarianism, um, Sun's Article 8 is trumped and jumped all over when you look at that. And that's still going on today. So what would you do there in those circumstances? Yeah. One of, one of the concerns, Carl, about social and economic rights in particular is really what drives the, those people who would argue against them in a Bill of Rights is um, the separation of powers between the judges and the assembly or the executive in our context. Um, and a fear that give the, give the court too much power, the court effectively becomes the maker of policy, which properly resides with ministers and with the assembly. Now, like I just that 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 concern is really not warranted because the committee will have had evidence from from other jurisdictions where these rights are already in place and common law jurisdictions that where their law the legal system is based on the English legal system. Um, so there's precedence in other parts of the world and it hasn't caused undue concern. But even assuming that that isn't enough to satisfy people. Um, the concept of progressive realization in social and economic rights is really important because it's that that if you have a view that social and economic rights shouldn't be included, it's that provision that actually limits the power of the court. Um, there's a, a, th a threshold beyond which people shouldn't fall. So, for example, in housing terms, clearly people should not be pushed into destitution. But beyond that, what social housing, for example, demands, if it was in, if housing was in a Bill of Rights, um, is subject to progressive realisation, which means how many resources, how much resources is there available, um, and are you getting better over time? Now, that's not to say that you can't regress. Take, for example, the pandemic at the minute. You know, everyone's rights have been suppressed beyond what they were prior to the pandemic because of the set of circumstances. So you can go backwards. But generally speaking, you should go forward, realizing over time. Now, how do you ensure the courts don't have too much of a hand in that? Well, in 2008, if, if committee wants to look at the, at the advice closely, you'll see the, commi the commission was very careful. It was alive to this issue. And what we recommended was, in terms of progressive realization, um, for those rights, the, the departments with responsibility for realizing them, so take health or education or housing, um, there should be a responsibility on them to report on an annual basis to the assembly and to be held accountable for progressive realization so that it can be scrutinized properly by the legislative body rather than by the courts um, and, and that members can determine whether or not what is actually happening with all the information of the finances and the policy choices in front of them as to whether the executive is moving forward towards the realization of the rights rather than keeping it static 
on, if it was unjustifiably static or going backwards. Um, and that's, that's important for progressive realization, you know, that how they're constructed um, in terms of the accountability mechanisms is as important as to what actually goes into the bill itself. So the, the, commission, the commission was very careful um, and it tried to properly distinguish, as it said in the open remarks, the separation of powers. Yeah, and I think for me, David, that's been my one of my big anxieties because I believe that, you know, um, I didn't even realise was the legal term, but it's even like the, a reasonable expectation, for example, to home. Okay. And so if you constantly go through all the different layers of accountability and they all fail, the court should always be the place of last resort rather than first choice. But here we have a systemic problem. And the issue for us is um, we need to look at, and I don't mean this dismissively, but what was in 2008 as the floor rather than the ceiling. Now, the floor in terms of their universal rights, they should be enjoyed and experienced by everyone. Um, it's the protector circumstances where you're going to get more political commentary, but those other rights are rights for everyone. They're universal. And my difficulty is that um, that we're trying to get the 2008 process into a 2021 process and um, and maybe it's just political naivety, but I don't understand what the, the problem is. And I feel that once we have a Bill of Rights and we can stand over it and review it ourselves annually, that if, if people feel that we're not doing our job right or we still feel disenfranchised or even discriminated against, then there's other places they can go to. But it's really important that the court isn't used to deny social and economic rights. And I've just heard too many people say that, that this has given the court a position where they're asked to make uh, policies or implement policies when that's not my understanding at all. So, and then the last thing I'll say is this, um, when it comes to the whole issue around the Good Friday Agreement. Um, there are issues that have crept up in terms of inequalities that weren't mentioned in the agreement. So, for example, like uh, reproductive rights and marriage equality, which was at the centre of political disagreements, had to be agreed elsewhere or implemented elsewhere, depending on you know, where you're sitting. But even within the Good Friday Agreement, there are rights that are still sitting there that are at the heart of problems. And we just, in my opinion, need to use European or any legislation as a way of just trying to cut through that. So I do believe a Bill of Rights, I mean, the importance in this, it isn't just something that people tune into on a Thursday afternoon because they're on X. There's a big expectation on us bringing forward a Bill of Rights given I suppose um, the fact that some of us w will remember 2008, but many others will absolutely not, absolutely not remember at all. And if you think of the kids, including my youngest son, born in a week of the Good Friday Agreement, who's 23, will not remember 2008, but are still talking about bills of rights. So I just want to thank you for your work and your, your presentation and your written uh, stuff for today. Thank you. Okay, David or Rhiannon, if you don't have comments, do that. Rhiannon, I think you do. Yeah, please, um, Chair, just one comment and really just to kind of build upon um, Cara's comments there. Um, and I appreciate the importance of, of implementation and the fact that things shouldn't always be left to the courts to resolve. It is almost a, a matter of last resort to, to go down the judicial route. But the Commission, that's 2008 advice, also suggested um, the creation of, uh, of another enforcement mechanism through a scrutiny committee in the Assembly. So we're the only um, jurisdiction in the UK not to have a, a specialist committee looking at human rights, so an equivalent to the, the Joint Committee on Human Rights. Um, and such a committee could have a place alongside a Bill of Rights to, to ensure that um, the, the Assembly had additional um, powers in terms of scrutiny.
on human rights issues, uh, issues arising under, I suppose, implementation of the Bill of Rights, um, t t meaning that the things wouldn't always have to, to go to the courts. Um, so an additional, um, additional role for the Assembly there as well. That's great, Rhiannon, thank you. And just, I don't have any other members syndicating, but just when, I, when, when we have you here at the committee, I think in light of the, the um, sort of social media and news coverage in the past week of the list or the blacklist from the holiday camp, and I know it's in a different jurisdiction in, in England, but I think it's important that we acknowledge and condemn the, the anti-traveller racism. Uh, which was espoused in, in that list from, from from that particular firm and acknowledged that that, in terms of a Bill of Rights, as an accountability measure and as something to focus people's minds on what's right and, and what's wrong and treating human beings with, with dignity, the idea that that sort of blatant racism can be publicly um, espoused and, and people fear no comeback from it as is, is is wrong in, in this day and age and it's important that we call that out when we see it so uh, that I just I just wanted to make that comment that I meant to do it at the start of the meeting but thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and um, unless you have anything else to add we can let you get on with your day and, and thanks for your contribution to, to the committee. Nothing else to add Chair, thank you and um, we're here for anything else that the committee wants um, we're at your disposal. Brilliant, thanks okay. very much. David, Brianna, and thank you. Committee, we can now move on to our next presentation. So we'll let broadcasting uh, move David and Rhiannon out. And our next item on the agenda today, number three, is a briefing from here from Danielle Roberts, who is a policy development officer of HERE, who are a lesbian and bisexual organisation based here in the north. So Danielle, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I want to welcome you to the committee um, and allow you to begin your briefing whenever it's comfortable. Thank you very much, Chair. Just check you can hear me okay. Yeah, there's a bit of feedback yeah. on interference. Uh, it's not the best, but we can't uh, hear you. Uh, okay. Um, is it coming from me, do you think, the feedback? You know, you're you're okay. It's just a wee bit blurry. But if all members okay. can, you know, that it might be me affecting you. Okay. Um. Thanks very much, Chair. And I'll get started then. So, um, here and I advocate for and um, support lesbian and bisexual women and their families, and we work to improve the lives of lesbian and bisexual women across Northern Ireland. We're the only women-focused organisation within the uh, LGBT sector here. And jointly with Cara Friend, we run a gender violence project supporting LGBT plus women who have experienced or who are at risk of sexual and domestic violence. And we also run a project um, empowering children of LGBT plus parents. We are members of the Women's Policy Group and of the Human Rights Consortium. And so as members, we have supported calls for a bill of rights in the Feminist Recovery Plan, the Women's Manifesto, and the Make Our Future Fair Champion. The Bill of Rights was a key element of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which 23 years on hasn't been delivered. The incorporation into the agreement of the European Convention of Human Rights is an essential element of the police process, and this is recognised by the inclusion of the issue in the new decade, new approach agreement and the work of this committee. The agreement outlines that the institutions of the Assembly will have safeguards to ensure that all sections of the community can participate and work together successfully in the operation of these institutions and that all sections of the community are protected. So often when we talk about communities, we use it as a shorthand for the ethno-national communities. But we have to remember that our society is made up of so much more, including the LGBTQ community, ethnic minority and racialized communities, and more. Any Bill of Rights must follow the commitment in the agreement to serve all sections of the community. I was 12 when the agreement came in, and I was doing my politics A level when school was suspended in 2002. I've seen debates and claims that human rights belong to one side, that they aren't for people from my background, this is generally untrue. Human rights are for everyone, and any Bill of Rights must have universality. The agreement allows for rights supplementary to those in the European Convention on Human Rights to be included in the Bill of Rights. Our position is that the Bill of Rights should incorporate international obligations, including on social and economic rights. These are detailed in our written response and include treaties such as CEDAW. By adopting these measures into domestic law, 
people in Northern Ireland will be able to access them directly and decision makers will be more easily held to account in the event of a breach. Scotland and Wales have already used powers within their own devolved competencies to explore giving effect to these rights. And um, it's within the power of the Assembly to do the same. There are threats to the Human Rights Act. We have a chance to protect against any rollback on human rights from Westminster by enshrining them in, in a Bill of Rights and in other measures incorporating international treaties. Um, additionally, a Bill of Rights would be harder for any minister or party to change, which would provide a level of security in the one certain time and could help protect against the divergence of rights on either side of the Irish border now that we're um, after Brexit. Human rights aren't um, a serial or a theoretical thing. Every day we rely on human rights in relation to healthcare, adequate standards of living and housing protection. However, none of these are currently protected as human rights in Northern Ireland. By including these as protected human rights in a Bill of Rights, the government would become accountable for ensuring they're upheld, facilitating the creation of mechanisms and institutions which can be relied upon to advance these rights. A Bill of Rights will also provide clarity for rights holders. We have a patchwork of equality legislation which isn't easily accessible to the right person. A Bill of Rights should be formed in accessible language for the public awareness campaign to ensure that everyone knows their rights and responsibilities and how to take action if they're breached. Symbolically, a Bill of Rights would signal a shift in thinking and policy making to a rights based approach where rights are central to the work of legislators. The aspirations set out in the consultation are welcome, but we can't just have aspirations. We need rights that are desistible. Um, that's an awkward word. Um, they have to be enforceable. Um, values may set out the intention of a Bill of Rights, but they have to be robust and actionable. There are many examples of individuals wanting judicial review to realise their rights, for example, on adoption rights, uh, same-sex marriage and abortion access, often at great personal cost, both financial and emotional, laying their private lives bare in order to secure rights for others. A Bill of Rights and a subsequent rights-based approach would shift this burden from individual rights holders to institutions. In preparing our response to this consultation, we hosted two workshops with the Human Rights Consortium. At this point, I want to acknowledge that the vast majority of attendees find the language used in the Constitution difficult to understand, and then they expressed that but for the workshop, they would not have responded as individuals. During the workshop, issues were brought up around mental health, around discrimination in the workplace, around access to health care, and um, all of this is reflected in our, our written response. A Bill of Rights is important for lesbian and bisexual women as individuals made up of many layers. For young LGBTQ plus people, it's vital that the right to education is delivered. The Department of Education's own research demonstrates that over two thirds of LGBTQ plus young people do not find school a welcoming environment, and 45% felt unsafe at school. On the right to family and family life and privacy and to security, Lesbian and bisexual women are more likely to experience a pregnancy as a result of a sexual crime or as an adolescent. They should be able to access an abortion to the GT following the CL recommendations, which are now implemented in the EFEF Act. However, services are yet to be commissioned. Of lesbian and bisexual women who experience a homophobic hate crime, 29% also experience almost a sexual contact as part of the incident. We need domestic abuse and sexual violence support services that are culturally constant and sufficiently resourced. The right to healthcare is a commitment to three rounds of IVF, which is yet to be delivered, and the regulations in donor IEI have yet to be sufficiently funded for the regional facility clinic to be able to deliver up on them. In terms of mental health, LGBT young people are three times more likely to contemplate suicide than heterosexual young people while trans young people are almost five times more likely to contemplate suicide. They like to be free from discrimination. 21% of LGBT workers believe their sexual orientation or gender identity would have a negative impact on their career progression. These are also called basic human rights, which everyone is supposed to be able to enjoy on an equal basis, but clearly that's not the reality. Lesbian and bisexual women may be parents, carers, workers, they may be disabled or from a 
the ME background, they may live in rural areas, they may be British, Irish, both or other, but all of them need a Bill of Rights. A Bill of Rights that is aspirational and focused, but also enforceable in reality, to ensure that everyone truly does enjoy their human rights and that they aren't just on paper. Thank you, and my opening remarks. Danielle, thanks very much for that. Um, I know you included your submission to the consultation um, in your in, in sort of as a as a written presentation um, today. So your oral presentation backs that up. I wanted to ask you, and you've you've touched on this. You've called a bill of rights a level of security, um, and I often think of it as sort of an accountability measure that would ensure that you know ministers and governments have to act in a particular way and have to protect the rights of, of everybody in society and obviously rights are universal. I wanted to touch on an issue that is, is currently a massive issue across the board in terms of women's health care and we know that any issue that affects women or that is a problem for women will have a disproportionately high impact on women who also qualify as a minority grouping, so lesbian and bisexual women or women who are from a BME background or, or whatever the case may be, will have a, a worse experience again uh, than, a, than a woman such as myself, a, a, a white Irish woman. But I, I, I wondered if you could um, touch on the, the issue around the fertility treatments and women's health care. I've spoken before about reproductive rights and the problem that's there because of political decision making. But the fact that lesbian, bisexual women are expected to self-fund before they're entitled to these treatments. So there's a go slow at the minute for everyone. But but the, the women that you're working with are, are going to be worse impacted again. Yes, yeah, so donor IEI regulations came in around a year and a half ago. So that's where um, donor sperm is used for intrauterine insemination. Um, and the regional fertility clinic just wasn't given the resources to be able to implement those regulations. They um, would allow access to women who are single, who are in a heterosexual relationship or who are in a same-sex relationship. So um, it opened up access, funded access to lots of people, which was really good news. Um, but unfortunately, they haven't really been covered. Um, currently, in terms of IVF, you're supposed to illustrate that you've been trying to conceive unsuccessfully for, for at least a year. Um, two women could try to get pregnant forever, and it wouldn't happen. Um, that's not how bodies work. So, um, in some instances, to prove that they uh, are eligible for funded IVF treatment, then women need to go through a series of uh, self-funded IVF treatments um, to demonstrate that um, they're to meet that requirement within the regulation. Um, women can also access um, IV, funded IVF treatment if, they're, if they have a diagnosed fertility issue like PCOS. Um, so that's for, for women regardless of sexual orientation. Um, so the, the need to demonstrate that you've been trying unsuccessfully to conceive for, for a year means that people either spend a lot of money on private treatment or they uh, take behaviour which is risky for their own health. Um, for example, trying to self inseminate um, using sperm that's been donated by a friend or relative or stranger. Um, which comes with a, a massive legal risk in terms of parental responsibility, as well as a risk for their health, so that it doesn't, it won't have gone through the same screening as if it was through a registered clinic. Um, so, women are opening themselves up to, to legal risk and health risk, or great financial cost, um, in many cases, before they're able to access funded IVF. And then on top of that, there's then the written list and the barriers that everybody trying to seek a conception is facing at the minute, particularly with the, the pandemic um, restricting services. Yeah, so uh, from what I'm from from what you're saying there, and you've outlined the particular problems that um, lesbian and bisexual women face, it's it's the enforceability of these rights. So something can be there in theory, but then actually being able to access it on the ground. Is the 
is, is where the problem arises. It's enforcing the rights, but it's also then the beyond just having the rights, and there's the, the regulations and the actual process. Um, so that that is down to the, the healthcare providers rather than um, than, than government to make those, those regulations. Um, so yeah, it's a mixture of it not being explicitly stated in um, like in the commitment to three funded idea cycle. Um, then the regulations don't have to implement um, access for living and women in particular. Um, so yeah, it's a mixture, but enforceability is something throughout a bill of rights that there needs to be. Um, there's no point in having a right on paper if, if you can't actually do anything about it. So that's, um, that's something we've seen a lot with the recent regulations on abortion access. Um, you know, we have supposedly had decriminalisation and, and new regulations for over a year. Um, decriminalisation is even more than that. And um, yet we still don't have commissioned services. So a right on paper doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, to access that right. And considering the yeah, number of sexual women in particular, um, we have made a written submission on the abortion regulations, so there, there's more detail in that if, if it's needed. But um, far more likely to be pregnant as a result of a, a sexual crime um, or as an adolescent. So the people who are particularly talked about in the CEDAW recommendation of needing access. Big time. Um, I'll pass now to the Vice Chair to Mike. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Sorry, I've had a difficulty on muting that. Hi, Danielle, thanks for engaging. I'm, I'm sorry to say the, the incoming quality of the audio means I'm really struggling. I, I'm not getting everything you said, but okay. uh, I suppose a, a comment and a question. The comment would be, I mean, I would campaign on <clears throat> better mental health and wellbeing. And in a society where we have shocking rates uh, I'm very aware that within the LGBTQ plus community, it's absolutely through the roof. So I'm wondering if there's something we can do within a Bill of Rights that might help to address that issue. And the other thing is, is I see in your response to our consultation, you come out very strongly against an aspirational Bill of Rights. But can I just confirm, you wouldn't have a difficulty if the preamble was aspirational in terms of saying, here's our vision for society and our rationale for Bill of Rights, as long as the body of the Bill of Rights had judiciable rights within it. Yes, um, the take was in reverse order, I suppose. Um, yeah, the preamble, aspirational values, that's all fine, um, but it was within the body of the Bill of Rights. There has to be a way for people to, to enforce those. Um, so, yeah, it's important that, um, that it, it's actionable and justiciable um, as well as, as operational. Um, we are working on the, the gender strategy and the LGBT strategy as well. And, um, yeah, it's, there's similar discussions happening around you know, what goes in the preamble and what goes in the, the body. Um, yeah, I think preambles. That's where the yeah, that's where the aspirations can go. But um, in terms of rights, you have to be you have to be able to act on them. Um. So then, your question about mental health. Um. Yeah, mental health. Where mental health is exacerbated for members of the LGBT plus community. I mentioned some figures in my my remarks. Um, one thing, again, I don't know how much this is in a Bill of Rights as opposed to a broader health strategy. Um, I don't know where the responsibility would come. So um, like the Rainbow Project have um, culturally competent counsellors for LGBT people. Um, so services like that are, are really needed. Um, but that's not something you put in a Bill of Rights. 
So it would be a broader commitment to ensuring um, mental health services for everybody who needs them. Yeah, I, I think the thing is that you know, if you're denied services that, that you want and need, that could be the reason why you're having suffering for mental health and, and well-being. So I, I think that there, there is something that perhaps could be done in the Bill of Rights, even if, <laughs> to, to cross you here, it's only in the aspirational section of it, but at least we, I think we've got to put the marker down and understand that you know, services and how people feel when they wake up in the morning, whether they feel they've got the same chance of a successful day as the next person, impacts on, on how you feel, on your mental health and well-being. But, um, I'm sorry, Daniela, the audio is bad. I'll, I'll leave it there. But thank you again for uh, engaging with us. OK, I'm going to bring Paula in next and then Carl. Danielle, I think it might be broadcasting or telling us that it might be something to do with your brand bandwidth. I can hear you, but just it's like mostly. Okay. Hi, Danielle. Um, good to see you at committee. Um, my first question is probably more. Um, uh, sounds uh, contrary, but I'm just you, you just mentioned there about the gender equality strategy and the sexual orientation strategy, and it's good that they're now being progressed by the Department for Communities. To what degree um, do the, um, could the issues that are, are, are affecting or um, impacting on the women that you represent, could they not be addressed in a strategy as opposed to a Bill of Rights? Yeah, I suppose I see the strategies as being more on sort of day-to-day -day deliverables, whereas the Bill of Rights would be more on, on principles for, for institutions to follow. And an overarching right, so it would be a right to healthcare, but not necessarily how that's delivered. Um, so I suppose that's where I see the difference. And um, the bill of rights being the floor um, of of what can be um, guaranteed, which then can be added to the strategies. But strategies have a time limit. Strategies run out after five years and have to be renewed. Um, whereas a Bill of Rights stands the test of time and is continuous. So I think we need both. We need a, a Bill of Rights to have the, the basic um, principles that can't be um, watered down, and then the strategies for actually implementing the, the, the aspirations and the, the, the measures in the rights. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I met with representatives from here and I uh, probably about six months ago when we were talking about sort of the impact on the family from lockdown and funding and stuff. So I just wonder if you could maybe speak to, you know, the um, how you feel a Bill of Rights would actually um, enhance the position of um, couples who are um, same sex and their children, um, whether or not they're from the same family or whether you know, their stepchildren, whatever, how a Bill of Rights that really reflects them, how, how they would feel about that in terms of their standing within society? Well, my my colleague, um, Garnie Gibson, runs the, the family project, so she would probably be better placed to, to answer. So if I missed anything, maybe she can follow up with you. But um, one, of the, one of the probably different issues that our families experience is... Um, whenever their children go to school or go to um, youth clubs or whatever and um, stations outside the home, then um, it becomes apparent that their family is, is different in some way. Um, and sometimes they experience homophobia not because of their sexual orientation or gender identity, but because of their parents. And um, that's that's something that our children's empowerment project is is looking at. Um, so ensuring that um, any discrimination measures or any rights to be free from discrimination and rights to access education um, include all Section 75 characteristics and um, that action is taken on homophobic bullying and um, it's not up to 
the ethos of individual schools, but is is enshrined that nobody should experience um, discrimination in whatever form um, because of other characteristics that, that they or someone um, can be related to them have. No, no, I appreciate that. I, th I think I raise it because, as you say, it, it's, uh, you know, a lot of the children really can be, as we find with all our, our sort of Bill of Rights um, evidence sessions, that the children really don't have a voice in this. And I suppose what we would be wanting to do in the Bill of Rights is actually give them the platform for them to, you know, call for a lack of, dis or, sorry, a stopping of discrimination. So thank you for that. Okay. I'm going to pass now to Carol. Thank you for your presentation. Um, mm -hmm. Danielle, I, I actually agree that we need to see rights within the Bill of Rights. Um, I mean, the strategies are one thing to do, look after the day to day, but there can't be a replacement for rights. Um, and even though there are rights that are within even EC. HR, it's again similar to the previous session we had, it's the implementation of those rights. So even the right to healthcare, um, given the discussion you've had about access to IVF treatments, um, it's the implementation of those rights that has been contested. Um, so I, I do think it's an important distinction to make. One thing I just want to ask you to elaborate on, because I, I do believe whatever we put down on paper needs to be in plain English. So even you could elaborate on the consultation process um, because any lessons that we or others need to learn, we're open, we're all very open to making things easier for people to get access. So even just some of your feedback would be appreciated. Thanks, Danielle. Thank you. Um there are a lot of complications happening at the minute. Um, the women's policy group, I think, has been on probably about 20 or 25 in the first three months of this year. So um, I'm used to reading consultations and to responding to consultations. Um, but it shouldn't just be people who have a you know, policy job that, that respond to consultations. It should be everyone. And um, even the use of sort of legal terms without an explanation. Um, so things like um, enjoy human rights. Um, not everybody is going to understand terms like that. Um, you're not going to see human rights as something they enjoy. You know, maybe a, you know, a nice cup of tea and a chocolate biscuit is what they enjoy. Um, so the use of words in different contexts being explained would be useful. Um, for example, in the consent to harm for sexual gratification. Um, there was in that consultation there was discussion about ADH and TBH. So actually having um definitions of what those things are for the lay person would be really useful. I know that's a separate consultation, but um actually that out and giving information um for people. Um we had engagement sessions with uh, the Human Rights Consortium. There are members of the consortium, um, but I've also had some sessions on other topics with representatives from the department, and I think that's been really good um, to allow people to uh, engage directly and ask questions, um, and that those are given some weight, um, because not everybody has time to write a consultation response. Um, so being able to um, to get their point across in another way is, is really useful. And I know we try to do that with our service users at the minute in, in the time of the pandemic, it's, it's extra hard. Um, and organizations like the Women's Regional Consortium, Women's Support Network, they also engage extensively with service users in writing their consultation responses. Um, but if you could sort of take out the, the middle step and have people engaging directly with, um, with with the people who are drafting the policies, and um, that would be good. Um, the Women's Resource and Development Agency have a guide. Um, I think it's referenced in a consultation response. If it's not, I can follow up on that. Um, putting women at the heart of public consultations. 
so they'll have a lot of um of recommendations for that and then also things like easy read versions um so there are some easy read versions of consultations um of things with you know pictures and bars simplified language um so having those available is is useful as well um yeah and also <laughs> time to respond um the time for the bill of rights i know it was extended but it was still um yeah it was still pretty pretty short especially as it came at the same time as, as a lot of other consultations so um ensuring that there's you know 12 weeks or more to reply to consultations to allow people to to think about issues and maybe have a, a workshop on them and um formulate their response um I think the use of online surveys has been really good. I think that has made them a lot more accessible for people who don't want to write a, a fully detailed response. But um, just being aware that of what questions you're asking and that they aren't sort of leading people down a particular route. Um, but online surveys, I think, have been um, a good addition in recent years. Thank you, Danielle. Okay. Okay, I think that's everyone, Danielle. So I just want to thank you very much um, for your presentation this afternoon and for your, your time um, with us. And um, I'll, I'll let you leave now. I know that the committee, we're going to be doing um, stakeholder events over the next couple of months. So those are going to be advertised. So I don't know if your organisation will be taking part in, in them, but, but there'll be um, different um, categories of events. So it might be something that you are involved in as well. So thanks very much. And I'll, I'll let you mm. yeah, go on. And, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, if we can get everyone back into the spotlight. So I know that Mark has left us, but we still have quorum. So the next item on our agenda is just chairperson's business. Um, and it was just, we had um, decided as a committee that we would finish taking evidence at the end of April. And from that point on, we would begin reporting. So last week or the week before, we had had um, a letter from ICTU asking to present to the committee. And we've managed to slot them in. Um, I think it's on the 18th of March. But I had just been speaking to the clerk and I thought it might be a good idea that we would rescind that decision to finish taking evidence at the end of April, to open it for one more week for the 6th of May, to allow for any other groups that contact us to be able to give evidence and that's just like the the, the final day so um we can't make that decision today the clerk has advised me that there's a formality within the committee that even if members agree that today we have to take it back next week and formally agree it that this is just notice this week but i just wanted to open up the floor to see if the members have views it's a good idea sure. yeah okay, yeah Carol. yeah happy with that Right, that's brilliant. So everyone's happy with that. So we still, we have to bring it it'll be on the agenda for next week's meeting so that we formally agree it. Um, and it's just to allow us space that if other people want to present that they can. So moving quickly on then, number five, we have the draft minutes um, from our last meeting, 25th of February. And you'll find it on page 234 of the pack if members are content with the minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Brilliant. Um, so number six matters arising. We don't have any matters arising this week. Agenda item seven is correspondence. Um, you'll find the correspondence memo at page two hundred and thirty-nine of the pack. Um, as previously mentioned, we have correspondence this week from the Irish Congress of Trade Unions who are asking to to give evidence to the committee. So if everyone's agreed, we can welcome them in the eighteenth of March, as they mentioned. Agreed. Yeah. Brilliant. So then we've got the forward work program from page 242 of the pack. And you'll see there we have quite a packed agenda for the rest of uh, the, the next two months before we move on to the reporting. So if everyone's content to agree that. Chair, sure, just in relation, just in relation to that, um, on the 21st, 22nd of June, it says there'll be a potential committee motion for plenary debate. Um, on what basis would we be, would we be having a, a a debate at that stage. Yes. That that would be a, around the report. Never did it. Although the report won't have been concluded by that stage, will it? 
depending on how you get on. <laughs> What's your, your number there? That might be a wee bit ambitious, but I suppose this, at this stage, it's in freedom from but at this stage, this uh, just on a rolling basis, so if it needs to be amended, we're not tied, I don't think, to any of these dates, but the hope is that we get that couple of months to report and that we are ready and to take it to the assembly at that stage before um, recess. Is everybody happy enough for that? No, I'm not sure. Yeah. Not, not sure, Chair. Sure. Okay. Happy to see how we go. Yeah. I, I, think, I think it's on that basis, you know, we have the process and if, if we're not ready, we're not ready, but we hope that we would be. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. To play it by ear, as they say. Um, so then the date, time and place the next meeting. Um, next meeting will be Thursday, the 11th of March, same time, same place. And I now want to ask members if you can stay on the call just for an informal session, just to discuss the logistics around our forthcoming stakeholder events. So I'm going to ask for all the to come to the public and bring all the members to the spotlight for just a very short informal session. All right. Assembly, Committee Room 29.